Hello and welcome to TP Talks, PwC's Global Transfer Pricing Podcast Series. In today's episode, we will be discussing how U.S. tax reform and other global issues, such as trade, have affected clients' approaches to their transfer pricing policies and what possible uncertainties there are for clients next year given some of the underlying policy issues. So in this podcast, we will be taking a unique approach and following a top 10 year in review format, tackling topic by topic with our subject matter specialists from an operating model perspective. My name is Dana Hart, and joining me today, I have three great speakers. First, I have Paige Hill, our National Transfer Pricing Practice Leader based in New York. Chris Desmond, our Value Chain Transformation Co-Leader and Transfer Pricing Principal with our National Practice based in Chicago. And Joseph Kovuliak, who is also with our National Transfer Pricing Practice based in Washington, D.C. Paige, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you to moderate the discussion. Thank you, Dana. U.S. tax reform in December of last year set off a chain of events that has led us to a new world order. And the key question for our clients is how do they need to adapt their transfer pricing to follow suit and prepare for what is ahead? We thought we'd have a little fun this time and cover a top 10 list of what the top 10 areas are for our clients, ranging a range of issues from U.S. tax reform to trade to the digital revolution. So let's start with number 10 on our list, which is the changing role and responsibility of a tax director. Chris, can you comment on changes in the U.S. tax director's role, given everything that's happened in the last year? Paige, happy to do that. It's been a really crazy year from a transfer pricing and tax perspective. Uh, Things have happened this year that we haven't seen in decades. And as a transfer pricing practitioner and a tax person, I I think the game has really changed when, when the reform first came out. You see tax directors being pulled into the CFO's offices and asking from a reform perspective, what hey, are we impacted? What does this mean for us and our company? So we've been finding that the head of tax has often now been brought into meetings with the CFO, meetings with the board, to help them think through what are these impacts mean for the company because they're really material impacts when it comes to taxes. But it's not only that page, we're seeing that then domino over to operations and M&A because now tax needs to be part of a lot of the strategy when you think about how the operations may change because we don't want to to be foot faulting and making an operational change without thinking through how that would happen from a tax side. And the same thing from an M&A perspective. So as companies are evaluating, maybe acquiring a company or divestitures of companies, need to think through, well, what does that mean for our company from a tax perspective? Great point, Chris. I think uh, clients are definitely having to be more active in their businesses. Um, Let's move to number nine. Number nine on the list is section 163J. Um, The new proposed regulations have a definition of interest that can widely affect many existing transfer pricing arrangements. Chris, can you address that? Yeah, happy to do that, too. I mean, of all the areas of reform, this is probably the, the lower end of the totem pole, hence number nine, not number one. And, and really, you know, even more recently, November 26, we gained some more clarity related to the 163J limits on the amount of business interest that can be deducted. And basically, it limits the deductibility to 30% of a taxpayer's adjusted taxable income, ATI, for a tax year. And from a transfer pricing perspective, it really just changes how we're dealing with debt capacity overall. That's great. Okay, let's move to number eight on our list, which is the unknown future. Joseph, can you elaborate on why this is number eight? Yep. So unknown future, digital economy, digital taxation. So if if I step back, uh, you know, we we went through a huge transformation over the last, I would say, two decades, uh, how we use Internet, uh, how we access Internet, how companies do their business, uh, how customers interact with the vendors and uh, governments you know, living in that environment, recognize that digitalization is transforming how companies, individuals do business together and how it overall benefits or impacts their economies. Second, the governments also recognize that digitalization has a broader implication for their economies other than just corporate tax where we live in, right? Uh, whether it relates to jobs and employment, uh, cybersecurity, consumer data rights, uh, competition or others, right? And governments are concerned that the existing global tax system that relies on fundamental concepts of source of income and the resident of the taxpayer are not adequate for such digital economy. Uh, in response to that, we've seen uh, OECD identify uh, factors common to digitized uh, uh, business models. Uh, we've, we've seen countries issuing their own papers, how they would like to uh, 
gain taxation, at least in the corporate tax uh, space, uh, to the earnings that relate to digital economy. Uh, now, what we've seen so far, and this year there were a number of uh, pronouncements made, uh, uh, Some th what, what we've seen so far is that there is no agreement among uh, countries on how to approach taxation of the digitalization or digital economy. Uh, we have seen uh, some unilateral actions uh, by some, such as uh, India or Slovak Republic, to broaden PE definitions to include uh, so-called digital platforms. Others, such as Italy, introduce interim uh, digital, what I would call excise tax or digital services tax on the gross revenue. Yet others, such as UK and France, want to tax use their contributions. Uh, U.S. is opposing all of these ideas and floating idea of a global minimum tax combined with the rights allowing the local jurisdictions uh, to tax returns on local marketing intangibles uh, that are used within that jurisdiction. Even if those investments uh, were uh, made uh, from uh, offshore, right? And then uh, EU Commission proposal, uh, which was issued in March, uh, for all purposes, we understand it's uh, it's dead in its tracks. Uh, uh, but Germany and France now proposed a taxation of uh, online advertising revenues uh, starting in January 2021, uh, but only if uh, OECD doesn't come to an agreement. So, so I would say stay tuned for 2019. In January, we expect to have OECD release uh, of a significant update on taxation of the di digital economy. So, so I, I think this, this will be a debate uh, uh, for the next several years before before everything settles down. Thanks, Joseph. Okay, so let's go on to number seven on our list, recent transfer pricing court cases. Joseph, what can you um, briefly share with us on, on some of the most recent cases? Thanks, uh, Paige. So, so, so let's start with Altera. As we all know, the appeals uh, court uh, dealt with the question whether the IRS uh, violated its uh, Administrative Procedure Act by failing to respond to comments from the business community arguing that the 2003 regulation was inconsistent with the arm's length standard as defined under the Section 482 regulations. So, so what happened this year, in July the 9th, Circuit uh, Appeals Court reversed the lower tax court decision, which was made in favor of the taxpayer. The Ninth Circuit reversed that and ruled in the favor of the of the government. Two weeks later, the Ninth Circuit withdrew its original opinion and uh, named uh, a judge, uh, Susan Graber, as a replacement for Judge uh, Steve Reinhardt, who died in March, but was initially counted in the majority decision, which was decided two to one in favor of the government. So we had on October 16 uh, questioning, so stay tuned. Uh, obviously, we don't have a crystal ball. Uh, another interesting case was Medtronic. So on uh, August 16 uh, of this year, the Eighth Circuit Appeals Court vacated and remanded the a lower tax court opinion in Medtronic case, uh, which in effect used a cut proposed by the taxpayer with the uh, court's adjustment to calculate essentially income allocation to the U.S. Uh, taxpayer. Uh, the appeals court uh, interestingly held that the tax court findings, uh, which were based on the application of the cut I mentioned, were factually insufficient to conduct an evaluation and pointed to the lack of the findings by the court as the basis for its uh, remand. This, this is something new. We've never seen this, uh, at least I don't remember seeing this in the transfer pricing space in the U.S. And although, uh, you know, courts uh, in a number of cases uh, have found it acceptable to apply broad judgments in making uh, transfer pricing determinations in terms of income allocations, especially with respect to intangibles, the, the Eighth Circuit opinion indicates that uh, likely some minimum level of uh, analytical rigor may be required uh, by some courts at least uh, going forward. Paige, back to you. Thanks, Joseph. Really interesting. Okay, moving up the list. Our number six item is guilty. Joseph, what are the top areas our clients need to keep in mind? I would say maybe two main objectives that I would uh, see tax uh, taxpayers considering. First, uh, you know, if the foreign effective tax rate for any U.S. multinational is above 10.5 percent, reduction of foreign taxes would be a sound tax strategy for those firms. Uh, second, uh, because of the expense allocation rules 
penalize taxpayers who already have high foreign effective tax rates. Uh, for those companies, re-examining the overall U.S. Uh, SG&A pool uh, would be recommended. At least I would recommend that to them. And in doing so, a three-step uh, process that takes into account requirements under 482 regulations and 861 regulations uh, would be the best practice. So where you can focus the first step on a 482 allocation analysis, uh, the second and third steps are also important, second step being allocation of portion of the stewardship expenses between the U.S. and foreign sources, which may require reliance on information, factual information collected in the step one, make, makes the step one and two effectively interconnected. And then uh, finally, obviously, the remaining stewardship costs could be apportioned between the U.S. and foreign sources using some reasonable allocation key. But if the step two is skipped, then the entire stewardship amount might need to be allocated based on uh, revenue between the U.S. and foreign sources based on the examples in uh, 861 regulation. So for taxpayers, be on a watch out to make sure that you don't miss the step two and that's the allocation under 861 rules. Back to you, Paige. Great. Chris, um, what are some of the specific impacts that Guilty is having on operating models? Thanks, Paige. So operating models is a big piece of this. And just to back up for a second, you know, as Joseph was talking through all of those allocations, I have to say from a transfer pricing practitioner perspective, one of the big changes we had to go through is trying to understand what 904 basketing was from a, from an international tax perspective, understanding what this general branch, subpart F, and now this guilty uh, type of basketing means and, and how that means and impacted from, from a guilty perspective. And so as a transfer pricing practitioner, the operating models are, are being looked at because there's some dramatic changes that are going on. And some of the focal points are as follows. So treatment of non-US QBI. So non-US QBI is good when it comes to guilty, but companies really need to think about how to strategize on this because what if you are expanding operations and you can't do it in the US? Um, where do you want to put it? How do you put it in a place that's going to maximize your non-US QBI to help you from a guilty perspective? And then you have this other stick that comes after you for tested losses. So if you have a CFC that has a tested loss, you get zero QBI deduction, which can be very impactful. So imagine this. A company has a $1 tested loss, you get zero QBI deduction. But this is where transfer pricing you know, comes into play because it's, it's good to think through and say, what are our strategies and how we do pricing? Because what if that CFC could be modified and they're within the arm's length range and now they have a small amount of profit? Then you get that complete QBI uplift. So there's a lot of different nuances on how transfer pricing actually is very impactful when it comes to QBI. But the thing is, you got to be careful with is that as you move those levers, as you maybe change transfer pricing, that will change the guilty calc. If you change the guilty calc, that may domino over to FDII and beat. So all this comes back to is modeling. And so that's what TP folks are really great at. We love to model, but modeling the impacts are not easy for us because they're really tax impacts combined with operating model impacts. So we have to work hand in hand with the tax team. So those are the things that I found to be critically important when it comes to guilty and number six on our list. Great. Thank you both. Okay, we're moving to the top half of the list, number five, ATAD and MLI. Um, we have to be mindful of what's happening in the rest of the world. And Joseph, as you're advising clients on potential changes to their structures in reaction to reform, how do ATAD, the MLI, and other BEPS considerations factor in? Yeah, so let, let's look at them one by one, right? So ATAT, uh, Anti-Tax Avoidance uh, Directive that is focused only for the members of the European Union countries, uh, uh, does do impact uh, uh, their local tax laws and affects a number of uh, tax structures that our clients have in place. Uh, as of January 1, uh, some of those countries are already implementing these, uh, and I think January 2020, uh, everybody else will have to implement the changes to their local tax laws to, to properly uh, address uh, some of the concerns, especially relating to hybrid and, and other structures. So what does it mean in practice for, for some of our clients? Uh, uh, if you, for example, have a hybrid structure, uh, such as, uh, say, home office for Maquiladora based in the UK, uh, where the the PE branch in Mexico is uh, exempt from taxation locally. Uh, going forward, you may be taxed on that uh, PE profits in the UK under the new or 
proposed UK law that will come into effect. So it, it's something that may affect some of our taxpayers, uh, some of our clients, and, and they will need to take this into account. So, so I would say anybody who has uh, any tax structures uh, that are utilizing any entities within the European Union, this, this will require to rethink uh, uh, the future strategies and, and future positions. MLI, on the other hand, is if you will, international, right? So it goes beyond the European Union. It, it is an ambitious project. Uh, I, I believe that OECD was uh, aiming to modify more than 1,400 tax treaties, uh, and, and it kicks in as of January 1 of 2019. Uh, so in 2018, we've seen a number of countries, I believe more than 15 jurisdictions already have uh, uh, ratified this and deposited uh, their model treaties. Uh, I believe it's more than 50 treaties might be already in force uh, that are consistent with the MLI. Uh, and if we step back, what, what is MLI, uh, multilateral instrument? It, it lets signatory jurisdictions to choose from a menu of provisions uh, that are designated to specifically prevent base erosion and profit shifting. Uh, the, the MLI rules are pretty mechanical and objective. However, uh, Interpreting the treaties modified by MLI requires each taxpayer to read uh, the text of the treaty, the text of the MLI, and because the MLI allows countries to choose from a menu of options, the positions that are adapted by each country. And this has to be done in conjunction to understand how the affected provisions of the treaty will apply. So for a number of our clients, uh, this will be important endeavor to now understand how their current tax structure is going to be affected by the changes in the treaties uh, with a number of new provisions uh, uh, that, that really, as I mentioned, to either hybrid structures, the principal business tests uh, relating to when the treaty applies or provisions and benefits of the treaty apply. So, so very significant change that uh, outside the U.S. will, will, will significantly affect all of our uh, clients and, and taxpayers. And then finally, you know, the, the 2018 was really big years for filing the country-by-country country reports. Uh, while I have not seen yet uh, significant activity by the tax authorities of using that information to select companies for, for the audits locally, I, I, I do expect, though, that in 2019, when this data is going to be fully analyzed and uh, and viewed by the tax authorities is that, that there might be a wave of questions that would be coming locally, uh, either asking reconciliations or other questions relating to results of the, of the local subsidiaries. Great. Thank you, Joseph. Okay. This brings us to item number four on our list, FDII, also known as what to do with your IP. Chris, can you elaborate? Happy to do so. And just six months ago, I think this actually would have been uh, further down the list, but I think we really come to realize the power of FDII. And for FDII, it's probably one of the most impactful areas of reform to TP practitioners. And the main reason is that all the benefits that are being received from it are primarily due to intercompany transactions and pricing. The challenge is, is that I think most companies and, and practitioners out there are cautiously optimistic because it's unknown on how long we're going to have FDII, how long is it going to be a benefit to U.S. companies. It may go away really quick or it may be around for many years. So companies are really thinking through what their strategy should be along these lines. So as Paige, you mentioned, how long will this last and really should I bring IP back to the U.S.? And FDII is, is about IP, but it also is about other types of charges involving tangibles and services. And when it comes to bringing IP back to the U.S., that's a tough one because that's something that once you do that, you don't know if you're you're ever going to get it back outside the U.S. So companies are thinking through, what are my other options? What things do I need to think through related to enhancing or maximizing my FDII, but also being cautiously optimistic of where this is going? For example, a lot of companies are doing M&A acquisitions due to the toll charge, but when you do that, and let's say you obtain a bunch of U.S. QBI, that's actually detrimental to you from a FDII perspective, because the more U.S. QBI you have, it actually erodes what your benefit could be ultimately from an FDII perspective. Also, companies we're finding are really evaluating the activities that lead to FDDEI, um, which are the eligible income activities, and looking to say, should I increase my service charges? Are my royalty charges from the U.S. accurate? Do I want to redo my analysis to see if maybe I can get a higher range or rate? Or even, you know, companies are talking about whether or not they should change their supply chain and treat the U.S. as a contract manufacturer so that the export of those products 
products could be considered for FDII. So a lot of companies are thinking about this, what it means to their operating model, and, and where does this go from here. So a bit of unknowns, cautiously optimistic, but that's why it's number four on our list page. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, and just to mention, uh, OMB received the FDII regs, so um, we should get guidance on how these apply very shortly. Uh, okay, we're up to our top three. Number three on the list is tariffs and the trade wars. Joseph, you want to comment on how this fits in? It, well, that's an interesting one, right? So I, I view it personally as a, a geopolitical head-to-head -head struggle between the U.S., which is an incumbent superpower, right, and China. It's a rising challenger, even though some other countries are affected as well. But by and large, this is the main dispute if you look uh, in the world today, right? And there's uh, there's also a deep conviction uh, among the White House economic policy team that the problem with China is not just the trade deficit, but the very economic structure itself in China, which uh, uh, they think uh, is putting foreigners at disadvantage, uh, not only in trade, right, but also in the uh, investing and operating in China, and that, that, that it distorts uh, business competition in favor of Chinese companies, right? So with, with this in the background, and if you also consider that most of the companies have implemented uh, global supply chains, creates a very challenging environment uh, and, and, and one where some companies can uh, can be the winners and uh, those that do not address it uh, could could be the, the losers, right? So, so it definitely is uh, forcing companies who source products from China, but also other companies that would be subject to tariffs uh, to reevaluate options uh, available to them, right? Uh, from as simple ones as uh, revisiting classifications of products to first sale structures to duty drawback uh, opportunities, uh, free trade zone, uh, uh, structures. And uh, lastly, but uh, uh, definitely for some, uh, very importantly, uh, re-evaluating their existing supply chains, whether moving portion of the supply chain, such as uh, uh, assembly final step uh, outside of China, to others revisiting completely where they source products and where they will place uh, uh, manufacturing cap capacity in the future. So definitely big changes. And Chris, how has trade changed the operating model landscape? It's um, had significant changes so far, and it's going to even have more changes down the line. I mean, the biggest impact is that tariffs are above the line, and oftentimes, you know, the, the tax team and the transfer pricing folks are, are not necessarily focused on those impacts all the time. Uh, transfer pricing generally is, but then it's the impacts on taxes ultimately. But what we're finding is the CFOs are saying, this has hit my KPIs, I want answers. They go around the organization, and one of the, uh, you know, folks in the organization is going to be the head of tax saying, what can you do to help me out? And, and quite honestly, it's taken a lot of people, you know, off guard. And tax folks are asking us, especially especially VPs and heads of tax saying, help us understand how we need to be part of this or what are the impacts for us. And, and the big thing is um, companies are rethinking potentially changes to their supply chain. And oftentimes they're doing this at a, maybe even a knee-jerk reaction and changing their supply chain where they're no longer manufacturing in China and moving it to another location. And while that's great to help mitigate tariffs, it may be a terrible choice when it comes to tax and transfer pricing, especially if that change is implemented without consulting the tax side of the house. So the takeaway here is that trade needs to be viewed from a holistic standpoint, and they need to involve, when a company's making decisions, not only the operational and above-line impacts, but also when it comes to tax and transfer pricing. Okay. We're up to our last two items. And the number two issue is the beat. Uh, we received proposed regulations uh, on December 13th, and Chris, what are the key takeaways? People have been, you know, on pins and needles for this one because this one has actually caused a lot of companies to really think that do they potentially even go out of business because of the changes that this has related to how they're being taxed. And so the biggest concern was the uh, SCM, and with regard to the information we just received, the 193 pages that were just sent out, um, relief was given to a lot of taxpayers because um, they don't need to use the business judgment rule. You still need to make sure that you qualify for an SCM. The, the biggest piece here is that only the markup component is captured in Beak, but the cost component is not. So that is a big relief for a lot of taxpayers. And now they can think through and move on to saying what is their beat impact. Um, a little bit silent on the cost sharing piece. And so I think that the where we're going is that the cost sharing regs um, are going to be what 
you know, trumps any sort of decisions here. But we need to be careful about the uh, anti-abuse areas that have been brought up here, where, you know, an intermediary arrangement would be disregarded or looked through. But at the end of the day, and 19 is going to be a big year in how companies think through BEAT because if you have an inbound finance company, offshore R&D, inbound licenses, or global service models, all of these are going to be impacted probably in a negative way, and companies are going to think through, is that the best for our operating model going forward? Okay, great. All right, and our number one hot topic on our list is the U.S. corporate tax rate. Joseph, can you help explain why this is our number one item? <laughs> well, it has been a huge game changer, right? It has been reduced as uh, part of the new U.S. tax law, and uh, and overall, it definitely changed the competitive landscape for the U.S. multinational. So, with the provisions that further reduce the the tax rate for, for example, foreign derived intangible income, uh, as Chris and you discussed earlier, you know, for those companies uh, potentially uh, importing IP to the U.S might be uh, something that they could consider going forward. Likewise, uh, having a lower rate may incentivize uh, putting other uh, activities in the U.S. that in the past would be more beneficial to locate elsewhere. So I view it as a significant game changer. And, uh, and we already see the spillover to uh, potentially OECD in their digital work uh, are now talking beyond the digital economy, what might be the framework of taxation globally uh, in the future. So stay tuned. Uh, this was a huge change for most multinationals with all of the provisions and lower rate, and it likely is going to have now spillover effect over the next two to three years as other countries are going to start reacting to it. Great. So that's our top 10 list of areas for our clients to keep in mind. Uh, before we sign off, I just want to ask uh, Joseph and Chris, you know, we're in the final month of 2018, and what can we expect in 2019? Sure, I'll go ahead and take that one page. So I would say that there's three things that I would put in the crystal ball for 2019 that a lot of transfer pricing practitioners and tax practitioners are thinking of. One is really taking a holistic view of transfer pricing, how it's interacted amongst the company worldwide and saying, is that the right strategy or should there be something else that we think through and how to really make sure that it aligns to how our operations are working, not only from a reform perspective, but also country by country. Two. TP and tax needs to be part of the company's overall operating strategy and decision making. This is more prevalent now than it ever has before. And then lastly, TP has expanded as a key tool to help navigate tax and operating impacts of a company. This is especially evident with tariffs. And so now the role of TP practitioners, in my opinion, is going to increase and rise. So what to expect in 2019? Uh, don't have crystal ball. I agree with what uh, Chris mentioned. In addition to that, I would say proposals that are coming out from Treasury relating to digital economy that do not relate to digital economy, and that is a minimal uh, level of global taxation and uh, taxation of uh, uh, or allowing countries to tax uh, marketing intangibles profits at the location of the user as opposed to at the location of the entity that uh, has all of the decision-making roles and responsibilities and funds the development of such IP. I think that can have a fundamental impact on, on, on clients or on the firm's uh, uh, footprint and strategies. Okay, that's great. Um, just like to thank Joseph and Chris. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, information we've thrown at you, so I'm going to turn it back to Dana. Great. Thank you, Paige, Chris, and Joseph. And thank you to everyone who took the time to listen to this podcast. We hope you found it informative. If you would like more information about this topic, please contact the speakers. Their email addresses can be found in the description of this episode. Thank you.